Sure. J.C. Hurt, 40-something. And I write when I get a good topic about culturally significant phenomena that seem ready to explode. Mm -hmm. And the first one of those was something that not very many new people knew about at the time called the Internet. (laughs) It turned into a book called Surfing on the Internet, published in 1994. The White Hat Year of Cyberspace. And the next one was video games. Uh, I, I wrote a book called Joystick Nation that was a, a history of video games and their effect on the minds of a generation, specifically Generation X, that was published in 1997. And uh, the third was CrossFit. <laughs> so there was a, a book called uh, Learning to Breathe Fire that I wrote, which was published in 2014. And which it, there's an interesting continuity between those because CrossFit in real life um, recapitulates some of the really deep dynamics of games, um, and including you know actual games like the CrossFit game. And so there are some really interesting through lines uh, about games and game design and what makes games so compelling. Um, between the video game history and an ethnography of this very physical face-to-face phenomenon. So, I mean, were these all, like, were these, like, subcultures you felt drawn to as an outsider? Was it stuff that you got interested in organically, became a fan of, and then wanted an excuse to, like, learn more about? Or how do you sort of think of yourself as weaving your way through those... um, seemingly different subcultures. Yeah, so, so with the internet, it was uh, an insider account and very much Alice in Wonderland down the rabbit hole because I was on the internet before the web as a student. And it was such an interesting and generative and bizarre culture. And part of the appeal of it was that it was very new. And so that was very much uh, a, a travelogue in a way. It was like writing for National Geographic and having visited this incredibly remote place uh, and, and writing all about it for people who weren't going to necessarily go there, although it turned out everyone ended up going there. The video game book was almost a memoir, in some ways, it was uh, an ethnography, but it was also the ethnography of something that had shaped me deeply. I learned how to play video games on an Atari before I learned how to read. So it, it was a, a taking stock, right, of, of someone who I was in my mid-20s at the time, and I was reflecting on, on something that I'd grown up with as it, it turned from a toy to this gigantic industry. And... CrossFit was the product of my husband getting into CrossFit and then experiencing the religious conversion that many people in the mid-2000s had about it. And I tried it for the sake of just trying something that my spouse was clearly enraptured by and immediately realized there was something very deep and very interesting going on here and that I should write about it. And I was also inspired by another book. I I was inspired by Christopher McDougall's Born to Run. And I'd read this ethnography of long-distance running and ultra-endurance marathons, and I was so impressed with Chris McDougall's ability to make putting one foot in front of the other for 40 miles interesting. That was a real accomplishment. Yeah. And when, when I... I was just going to, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, no, but when I discovered CrossFit, uh, you know, the thing about Born to Run that was so amazing was that it tied this modern sport to these ancient primal and prehistoric narratives and anthropology. And CrossFit isn't endurance. It's intensity. 
And so it really became a, an orthogonal investigation of intensity, just as Chris McDougall had investigated endurance as an element of the human experience and, and, and the emergence of sport, actually, in ancient human society and how did that happen and why did that happen. The benefit I had was that intensity is inherently more dramatic than endurance. One foot in front of the other for 40 miles, not inherently interesting, but a bunch of guys and gals struggling to lift heavy weights above their heads and push sleds and climb ropes competitively, as sports writing go, goes, that's as good as it gets. And so I, I got to have a lot of fun doing sports writing, which I hadn't done before, and pioneering some methods of sports writing in the era of online streaming social media that the old baseball writers and football writers couldn't have done because they didn't have that technology. And, and that's one of the most amazing things about writing about sports now is that you can literally see frame by frame from different angles and use that to construct a narrative and as a prompt to the people that you're talking to to say, okay, so at this moment you were there, she was there, someone over here was screaming at you, what were they screaming, what were you thinking? And people who don't remember what they remember will suddenly re recollect what was happening because you can put it in context. So I always feel, uh, you know, in these conversations, because ostensibly they are, I mean, and, you know, you know, because we've talked before that, like, this is and isn't about video games. It always feels a little absurd to be like, yeah, that thing you said about the rest of your life, that <laughs> about video games. Um, uh, <laughs> So, like, I guess I wonder just, like, to be extra meta and weird here out of the gate, I mean, how kind of, like, preposterous is the idea of, like, having a discussion or a conversation about, like, your legacy of, um, you know, writing about video games? Like, is that even a way that you think about it yourself? Well, well, I, I know mean, that the I, legacy I, is a I, bit I, much. I, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I'm happy to laugh at myself because the, <laughs> the joke the joke going around in all, all the editorial meetings and all the pitch sessions that I ever did when I was an author and a freelance writer was that you could give JC any topic and she'll report it and she'll research it and she'll get a great story. And in the last two paragraphs, it'll be about what it means to be human. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can relate which, to that. Which I'll cop to. Yeah. Which I will probably cop to. Because ultimately what interests me and what interests everyone is the human experience. Whether you're reading a nonfiction story or you're reading a great novel. And there is something in game which elicits from us these uniquely human experiences and emotions because it simultaneously challenges our cognitive faculties, our reason, which is one of the things that separates us from animals, but also takes place in an interpersonal context. If, unless you're playing a single-player game, you're playing against someone. And so you've got to model their mind and try to predict their actions. And this is also very human. So was and it separates us from machines because machines typically haven't been that good at it. AI is not great at predicting human behavior, especially in, in novel circumstances. So this mindset of, um, I mean, I don't know if that was a reputation you earned or you felt you were looking to earn of, like, tying it back to what it means to be human. Um, was that a mindset that you had going into covering games when you first started to write about games? Like, like how was that received in the late 90s? Because I think that really was sort of a time where... Uh, 
kind of, you know, it, it was, I think it was mainly assumed that, you know, the, these are just consumer, consumer goods and there's no, no, no yeah, greater depth so to be mined I, there. I, I, that's why I tackled it though, because the, the video games were considered a triviality, a toy, a, just a, a product. Yeah. And what I saw and realized and what a lot of people realized who've grown up with them was that they were a domain of design, the same way that architecture is, the same way that gr graphic design or, or industrial design is, right? Organizations give out awards, right, for architecture, for industrial design, for graphic design. It's, 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 it's a way of shaping the environment. And it, it was... It's one of, because it's a medium, it requires design, but it also merges into this territory of art, right? So there, it, it's a kind of a total art, the same way that opera is in a weird way, because it, it, it incorporates so many other kinds of creative practice. So you have the visual design, you have the sound design, you have the interaction design. And all of these combine in in a game, and so it's it, it's a pretty sophisticated uh, design medium, and in in the highest cases, you know, some, something of an art form. Although in in other cases, it's more of a piece of industrial design, uh, like a first person shooter. It, it's very similar to a Ferrari. You know, it's just a great piece of design. The the way it works and the way it goes and mm -hmm. the way it makes you feel. But then there are people who would claim that Ferrari is a piece of art. <laughs> so that, 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 that gets into, you know, a very meta discussion about the differences between art and design. But uh, the principal difference that I see is that the, the design has to work on some level. It has to function. There's functional attributes to it that, that art doesn't need. Well, so how, 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 um, how, was, how was this approach landing with um, editors at that time, or, or readers in general, like like who was reading your columns, and, and well, was there a the, yeah? The, it it was an interesting time, it, and this is very much about where we were in the late nineties. It was the dot com boom, if you recall. Yes. And it was raining advertising money, so the New York Times decided to put out a bucket called the Circuit Section to cap some of that advertising money that was raining down. And the circuit section was all about technology and consumers' relationship to it. And they offered me this column to write about game design. And because they were the New York Times, they wanted it to be an elevated column, not just a review, right. but something very similar to what their opera critic did, right? It, it, you couldn't, I didn't want to just say that a video game rocked or it sucked. <laughs> well, why does it rock? How does it suck? Why? Yeah, and, why? And they even told me, this is going to be something like our opera column. We know that most people don't go to see the opera, but it's very important for us at the New York Times to have a critical opinion about opera and to have a critical language around it. And that was the exciting thing for me was to create a critical language around game design because there was not. Right. Well, I mean, do you think like, like, so who was reading your column? Like, was it game designers? Was it lay people? Like, did you get the sense that the, the language you were trying to help build were people picking it up, or were they flabbergasted, or, or what yeah, was the response? So I think that, that I got a lot of mail from regular readers who enjoyed the column because video games were kind of a guilty pleasure for them, and they liked to see them elevated to the status of being worthy of criticism. But I also got a, a lot of feedback from game designers who said that the column was valuable because they worked so hard on shipping those games that towards the end, they, they couldn't even see what they'd made. They were just tunnel vision into the tactical demand of getting the product out the door. And I even got a few notes you know, that were humorous to the effect of, oh, so that's what we made. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And, and, and they loved it because it was a, an external perspective on their work that took it seriously as, as a, a work of art or a work of de- design. And it was also something that they could send to their families, to their friends, to their art school classmates, or to their uh, MIT classmates to say, here, see, you know, I'm doing something, you know, that's not just really cool, but that's actually, you know, worthy of, you know, media attention. Mm-hmm. And, and, and there was a lot of forwarding and re-forwarding because at that time, the game theory column was part of this wave of legitimizing video games as a medium. And th- there were other people who were doing this as well. Carl Goodman at the American Museum of the Moving Image was a curator who pulled together a museum exhibit about game design and he put the arcade cabinet in a museum. And that was a really big deal that these objects were worthy of curatorial attention and, and an exhibit catalog. Right. Right. Um, that 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 was new and really great because that's that's what should happen in popular culture is that we should be able to have uh, critical discussions around these new forms of media and 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 it should be high quality criticism which is not about promotion or condemnation but really to, to foster a language to discuss things in depth and to differentiate not just good from bad, but why the good things are good. So did you feel, or did, did you and the other New York Times writers at that time feel like um, you, know, you were bridging sub and mainstream cultures? It wasn't as much about bridging subculture and mainstream culture. Yeah. Because games were as mainstream as it got, right? It was really about bridging low to high. It it was similar to what happened with fashion journalism. When in the 50s, people started writing about fashion, not just for the ladies who might consume it, but as a form of art, as, as, as something that's part of high culture, because before it was just dresses. Mm-hmm. It wasn't inspiration. So the, the fact that there was a Chanel that could be discussed as high culture and, and everything that came afterwards, that was new. That was bridging high to low. And, and that's really important because that, and, and it's a big part of what makes America, America. Because in, in Europe and in, in, in other cultures, there's high culture, which is the educated elite culture. And then there's low culture, which is basically street food. And those don't have anything to do with each other. And in the U.S. and in American culture, there's this, mixing, there's this blurring between low and high culture, which is part of what makes our culture so vibrant. It's the fact that street photography goes into the Museum of Modern Art. That, that's part of what makes us great. And, and it creates a huge vitality. So for a critic to create this bridge between low and high, is part of what makes the culture vibrant. And that's a very rewarding thing to do. Hmm. Well, do you follow um, much of what people are saying about games now? I don't. <laughs> I don't. Which is not, I don't for, I'm I not don't here for, to advocate uh, one way or the other. I'm just curious because no, I know I we spoke a while a, ago. I know for a couple reasons. One is that the pace of innovation in games 
was incredibly high when the pace of technology to enable games was high. Like there were there was a new ability to do things like 3D, right? So that made huge, huge innovations possible, a new forms, a new genre. And as the technology plateaued, the design innovation slowed as well. And we have these genres like first-person shooter and real-time strategy game and massively multiplayer online game. And, you know, the, the, our genres are... are largely said, I mean, the biggest innovation that happened in the last five years is probably Pokemon Go, right? And that was technologically driven. It was augmented reality because we never had the ability to do that before. So what could you do with it? And there was something really new that happened. So when you get to a place as a critic where everything reminds you of something you wrote about two and a half months ago, that's the time to stop. Because you, you don't necessarily have much news that you can contribute. And games have consolidated financially. They've become very expensive. They've become very blockbuster. And so the, the, the organizations releasing them don't take as many risks, which they're not going to. If it's more expensive to create and release something, the organizations producing and marketing it are going to be more conservative. So there's just less new stuff to look at, think about, talk about. And on top of that, there's a lot of what I think are uninteresting debates and discourse around games in social media and the, the culture of producing games and the juvenile and sociopathic <laughs> elements of it, right? Yes. And I'm not denying that they're juvenile or sociopathic. I'm just saying that discourse isn't interesting to me. Right. Right. Um, I don't know. It makes me wonder. I mean, like you were you were talking about like um, you know the museum of moving images, and mm -hmm. I remember like a huge fuss was made around like when MoMA um, included video games in its exhibits, and mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I'm wondering like how much of these sort of debates or discourses or discussions, like how much of it isn't interesting because there just doesn't seem to be much institutional memory, like these kind of things that happen. Um, I mean, maybe the first time the people arguing <laughs> about them may have thought, yeah. them, but there seems to be little awareness that, um, you know, that there was someone like you writing about this stuff, um, you know, uh, not that long ago. Um, and, and I've talked to a lot of people who are game developers who just sort of burn out on the discussions because things are being relitigated again. Mm -hmm. Uh, with no yeah. new information and no expectation of reaching a new outcome, and no awareness that um, it's been <laughs> it's been discussed before. <laughs> yeah. So I don't yeah. think there's a question I, I, yeah. in there, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. I, I think that's a postmodern phenomenon, right? We our our art history takes place over enough time with enough institutional memory so that. References to something 100 years ago are easily made by people who are just getting into art. Mm -hmm. And when you have design that is technologically enabled, there's this risk as the technological generations of hardware and software turn over and the personnel turn over as well. Because... The, the, the coders who, who, who made Nintendo games yeah. aren't actually still coding games. They, they moved up into management. They went through something else. Very few of them are, you know, at age 60, <laughs> still in there doing stuff for, yeah. you know, PlayStation or online games. So the the... the the longevity of the people making stuff is much lower, and and that reduces institutional memory as well. Right. Well, so, and then and then also in that case, I mean, there's things like um, 
you know, NDAs or there's really not much of a motivation um, for people to talk. I guess like if we were speaking in a purely cynical way, you know, maybe people are just waiting to someday write their book or something. <laughs> well, I don't even know that. I mean, I also think it's about how people become game developers. Right, so there are game design programs at certain universities. Yeah. I know there are. Yeah. I, but people don't generally come to work for game development companies that do that route. Some of them do. But a lot of them are just great coders who are super fans mm-hmm. or come from art school because there's a lot of skill now required to do the 3D art. But those same art students are also being recruited by movie studios because they can do 3D effects. I mean, I gave a commencement speech in 2011 at the Ringling College of Art and Design, which is the premier uh, digital design school if you want to be a 3D animator. Mm-hmm. But those kids were being recruited not only by the game studios, but by Industrial Light Magic, uh, and 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 the Lord of the Rings studio and everyone else, and so I, it's 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 not like people go to art school and learn all about art and then go make art. Right. People learn whatever skills they need as tradesmen, and then apply them in their jobs. So it, 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 it almost has this, this quality of being a trade rather than being a, an, an art firm from a, a human resources perspective. <laughs> you know, they could be plumbers or carpenters <laughs> as far as the institutional memory. Like, you're not going to hire a carpenter who knows the whole history of carpentry and all of the amazing masterpieces of carpentry for the last 700 years. This is not how carpentry is assimilated right. by our culture. Um, so, yeah, it, it, but then part of it is also technology. Like, who playing games now would actually have access to the machines that could run the old coach? And this is something that Carl Goodman battled with as well as a curator, because in order to exhibit some of those old games, if you didn't actually have a arcade cabinet or an old console, you had to go and create a physical interface and, and also an emulator. Right. right? So the operating systems that these games ran on aren't even existent, really. So we have this attrition of memory because the old works aren't technically accessible. If you wanted to play a computer game that was released for, you know, a Pentium, I would defy you to do it. Uh, a couple, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I had a thing uh, with a friend where we were going to try to meet up and play civilization together. And, yeah. and uh, we just sounded like <laughs> on the Skype call, just two of the oldest guys alive trying to figure out how do you update it? How do we do this? And um, he is on a different platform than when he was, when he bought all these games mm-hmm. and we slowly learned he actually can't play anything that he technically owns anymore because now he's on a Mac yeah. and I'm on a windows yeah. and the game yeah. would let us play cross platform. Um, yeah. So it's hard to actually even experience these things anymore. And I have a box of them in my basement. <laughs> but I have no idea how I would actually play something like Ceremony of Innocence. Yeah. Because released in, what, 98, 99? I have no idea how I would access that experience. Yeah. So it, it, all, it all molders. In, in, in its accessibility because of these 
technology problems, which is why we probably should pay some more curators and technologists to, you know, to create good emulators for everything and, and, and sort of port it over, over. But the emulation issue was, was very much in curators' minds, even in the 90s, because they were collecting things that they knew wouldn't be able to run within three, four, or five years. So how do you even collect things? Yeah. Well, what about institutional memory? I mean, as a, as a, as a writer, when you were writing about these things, was that, uh, I mean, were there ways where you started to sense maybe there was some tail chasing that was going on or was it very transparent with your editors at that time? You know, like the examples you said, like, Oh, this should be like, you know, approaching opera or like approaching fashion. Um, no, I, I think they were game for that, so to speak. They, they were very really? much up for that because we, well, because they wanted people to enjoy reading the column who had, who, who didn't play games. They, they knew that most of the people reading the game theory column weren't, playing video games and they wanted them to have fun reading the column anyway yeah and 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 i wanted them to have fun reading the column in fact i had friends read drafts of my column and i would watch their face and i wanted at least one moment where they would smile or laugh because that 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 meant i was conveying something essential that that would bridge to them the experience and Th that goes to my style of writing. I use a lot of metaphors. Yeah. And partly it's because if someone doesn't have direct experience of something and you want to connect them with the essence of it, you have to give them a metaphor that bridges them over. And in, in games, you need to do that. I mean, I remember um, one column that I wrote for the New York Times was about this game called Knights and Merchants. And it was one of these, you know, civilization style kind of historical simulations, except it was German. <laughs> and so the, the process and the diligence that you needed to play this game was huge. You couldn't just, you couldn't just feed your surf. You had to actually raise the corn to feed the hogs, to make the sausages, <laughs> to then feed your serfs, right? And so I made this joke that a German company makes some of the best supply chain management software in the world, SAP, and by the time you get finished playing this game, you're really going to want it to manage your medieval society. Mm -hmm. But it was a game about cultural differences. And, and how culture shapes art. So, you know, one of one of the other games I wrote in the context of this column about Knights and Merchants was about this German game called Bundesliga Manager. And the soccer league manager, and it's a soccer league management game that was the most popular game in Germany at the time. Right. And in the soccer league manager game, you don't actually get to play soccer. You just manage it. You set the prices in the concession stand. You manage the arena. You, 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 you administer the teams and all that stuff. And, it, you know, it, 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 was, it was a great look, right, at why such a game would work in Germany and be very commercially successful. <laughs> but perhaps Bundesliga manager has no commercial viability in this country. <laughs> Perhaps. And not, not just because people don't play soccer. This is not the kind of game we want to play. Um, but, and you didn't have to play Nice and Merchants to, to have fun reading that column. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's tough, and I don't even know if it's fair to ask you a thing like this if you don't really pay attention to much, um, you know, writing about games today, because um, there are other writers I talk to I mean, there, there seems to be, not that it's a binary, but there seems to be two ways of approaching it as a writer, which is either you're, you're writing to people who already get it or you're writing to people who don't yet get it. And sometimes there's like translation work that needs to be done to sort of get those two, group, two groups to sort of be aware that they can talk to each other. Um, 
But I think part of the difficulty is like, you know, we're t- if we're talking about the years after the dot com stuff and budgets get slashed, I mean, yeah. more places are writing about games, but many of the places that maybe were before have either slimmed down, trimmed down, totally stopped, or there's this thing now where, you know, maybe they're aware of games, but they're not sure how to cover them, or they have their one person now who will cover it. And um, that's just a roundabout way of asking, like, if you're aware of like what kind of translating work like that is is missing today or do you just have no sense of it i don't i i i don't see it partly because of this financial implosion and and yeah critical critical implosion of of media right it, it's reduced to clickbait in some instances I can't really tell the difference between a lot of what used to be mainstream consumer media and just clickbait pages. Oh, I think um, that maybe that, I'm sure that's by design. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, so, so that's that's one issue is is this budget, but the other is how people make decisions about not only what to read, but like what to buy. And the, there was always a a relationship, at least ostensibly between the writing about games and informing people's decisions about whether those are good games to play. Yeah. There was, there was some semblance of a Um, it was a consumer product so you were writing about it with at least some awareness that someone was going to buy or not buy it and now people just don't look to journalists to make decisions about what they should talk They'll, they'll look at stars on Amazon they'll go to specialty forums They'll pull their friends. They'll um, find out whether their friends are also playing that game because it's a social phenomenon. And if their friends are playing, if all their friends are playing the game, they'll play it even if it sucks because the fun is playing with their friends. Right. So they don't need journalists to to tell them whether it's a good consumer decision to buy the game. And people who don't play games aren't reading as much anyway, right? So, so there aren't the venues, like the places you could publish those kinds of essays, right? And the New Yorker probably, you know, still does things like that. Um, but but the, the, the critical discourse is almost, yeah. And people don't actually have the critical thinking practice to consume and enjoy it. And, and that's the same of, of what passes so much for, for writing about popular culture is, is the whole notion that we're in this binary world where things are to be either celebrated or condemned. Right not understood and not subject to curiosity. You needed a lot you need a lot of curiosity to be a good critic. You need to look at something and have a response to it, but also ask yourself, the people who made it, what why where did that decision actually come from? Or what is it that makes this otherwise bad thing so appealing? You have to be curious, and in general, we have become less cur- curious, much to our own detriment. Yes, I would agree, but I'm probably <laughs> probably biased <laughs> about that towards curiosity. Um, well, but I think there, there's um, I think that there's two th- there's two things I've noticed along these lines, and one is. I, I, I talk to people who are critics or I talk to people who are recovering critics who feel when it comes <laughs> to games, maybe we're all just recovering critics. Maybe it's yeah. redundant. Um, 
they talk about like a wish for the whole enterprise in in writing and thinking about games to sort of decelerate. So like in other words, if a game comes out on Tuesday, if they haven't finished it and have an opinion by Friday, then they feel like they're behind. There's another thing that came to mind, but I mean, was that even a part of your life <laughs> when you were writing? Oh about no, games yeah. Before? I mean, I had to I had to play through an entire game every week. Yeah, that's grueling. So, and, and, Um, there's this other thing that's sort of catty corner to that, which is, um, I mean, it's, it's a question that doesn't really have an answer, but I, I feel like when I often see, I mean, actually there was a thing, um, <laughs> I think three people sent it to me today asking if I had seen, um, you know, something the New York Times had written about with games over the weekend, which was, uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, video games like Animal Crossing or Red Dead Redemption 2 or other, you know, big online games, how they're starting to sort of overtake Zoom for some um, people who are just exhausted with Zoom. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's one track to that, but I think it's like, I, I read that and I'm always trying to figure out like, well, is this is this a thing that's sort of, like, will we see a thing like this about movies or about books or something else like there's often this attitude that like when a, when a game makes any sort of cultural impact it's seen as revelatory in a way that like other mediums um don't have that sort of like <laughs> maybe uneasy confusion over. Right, because, because i think it's still associated with you know, juvenile yeah leisure <laughs> I, is that just here to stay? Like, because I, I think it's been like. Oh yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Uh, of course, because because nine year old boys are always gonna love it, <laughs> and that 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 and that's the challenge, right? For a critic, is how do I give weight to this thing that nine year old boys like without looking like a complete idiot? <laughs> yeah, I'm half laughing because I guess I used to be part of the problem long ago here. Oh yeah, yeah. I, you know, and so yeah. So I mean, it, yeah. That it's that, and it's a, it's a fine. It's a it's a it's a delicate line, right? Because yeah. I think it is possible to look completely pompous and pedantic writing about video games, and people have done it. Yeah, and it's it's you've read it. You've read all. Of it. Yes. Yes. And especially when you get into the academic literature, 
then it's just truly ridiculous and silly because you, you, you take something that is meant to be completely intuitive by design and make, and write about it in a way that is unintelligible and abstruse. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think somewhere in here, too, I mean, when we spoke before, however long ago it was, you know, you said something that stuck out to me and I jotted down, which is that you said that you felt in the time you were covering games, um, you said that you covered about 92% of the waterfront in two years. Mm -hmm. And you had the feeling it was going to take another two years to do the last 8%. And, yeah. um, you know, I don't know, like, I guess maybe part of the question is either like, what was the other 8% or what is, I don't know if the question is like, not, it's not quite like, well, what's wrong with repeating yourself to, to finish that other 8% or I guess like, I don't know. There's like 90 questions in there. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think that, that there's anything necessarily wrong with Whoa, me things, repe I guess things I was repeating. Wondering, yeah. I guess it's I was wondering like less, what's particularly. It's just less, it's just less fun. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Because if my, so my mission was to create a critical language around game design. And as you get to the majority of the critical language, all of the vowels and most of the consonants. Yeah. There's, there's less new language and tools for thinking to create. And if, if that's where the passion is, and it was for me, the enterprise becomes increasingly less interesting. So you can say, well, this is a variation of that, and it has some new twists, and it has this thrill, and it does a good job. But you can't really say much more than that. Um, and and, and that's just, it just, I like being on the learning curve. And and it and, and the, one of the, the reasons I stopped was that the learning curve was getting flatter and flatter. And so I wanted to do something else that would force me to learn, you know, more quickly and deeply. But 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 that but the, the maturity of, of genre in games is great. It means that that there are some fundamental principles and that people don't have to invent the wheel every time they do things. And, and it may even be that a natural senescence of games because of technological obsolescence is good. It means that people can reinvent things right, without feeling like everything has been done. And that's also good. Mm -hmm. Well, what was that other 8%? I mean, if you can remember or even reconnect with thinking of so it. The other 8% the other eight would be things like Pokemon Go, which happened 20 years later. Uh, it, would, it would be words with friends. It would be like new ways of playing games and a, a sort of a new modality for games that someone had decided to invent. And, and, and that's what I mean by the other 8% yeah. was stuff that was tr truly, it was a new paint color that wasn't in the box. Because that's exciting. Um, but it just takes so long because most of the paint colors are pretty good. <laughs> and you can mix them up to make pretty much whatever you want. So yeah. you're not going to get, you know, UV paint very often. Um, I think, uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of that's kind of what that's kind of what I meant. Yeah. I mean, were there places you wished or hoped? I mean, obviously, if you feel like it, you could you could pick it back up and write again. But in that time, I mean, as you were sort of winding down and moving on, uh, were there things you were hoping to I, maybe get to? Yeah. Or? I mean, I I actually wish that people would take some of the like wacky things and sort of redo them because there were some really incredible original things that, that like monster rancher, 
where you actually had to put your CD, a CD, a music CD. Yeah. In, 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 in the, in the, in the CD slot of your computer and it would take the, 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 the track length and other variables and use it to produce a creature. So you didn't really know what it was going to be when you put your, you know, uh, you know, your, your gun PJ Har- when your, or, or PJ Harvey disc, right? In the, in the <laughs> slot. And, and, and that was, that was so interesting. And I think that if someone wanted to do some kind of, you know, AI creature thing again. You you could put your Spotify playlist through that thing and see what happens. Mm-hmm. And there's 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 so much potential for delight. And 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 and, and even taking these just old forms and and old mechanisms, uh, stuff like scavenger hunt. There's no reason why the world of social media couldn't become a giant scavenger hunt for something that went into a game. You could there. there I, 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 there's so much potential, really, for creativity, and I think that that's part of what bugs me is that there are some truly amazing works that could be made. And could even be monetized, to use such a crass term. <laughs> I'll allow it. <laughs> I mean, I look that at- aren't being done because people they they're not thinking across media. There's all this lip service paid to you know trans media brands and and all of the stuff that you can exist in all these things, but there's not very many things that are existing truly across. And that's such an interesting opportunity. And that, that, that's part of what makes Pokemon Go so incredible, is that you had a game, you had the Pokemon thing, you know how to play that, but then there's a phone and there's location and there's this kind of scavenger hunting thing. And that was surprising. You don't know what you're going to get. And there, there was a mystery and a delight in that. And I think someone on, on, you know, there's probably, um, for all I know, and, and, I'm, and I feel terrible about this, but there are probably a ton of these things on Kickstarter. <laughs> probably. I mean, something that But that's always... where people should go. In fact, um, there, there, a friend of mine launched a game on Kickstarter, and he was like old school game industry guy, and he just wanted to get out of the rat race and do, you know, a, a great creative work on his own pace with his friends. And if I were, um, if I really wanted to dive back into games, I'd probably just, just look at things on Kickstarter. I think Kickstarter should hire a game critic. And, and, and to promote all these sui generous things that are happening on Kickstarter because people have real passion. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, something that captures my imagination a lot is um, procedural generation, or, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess they can do it in text as well. Uh, It's harnessed in very minor ways, but you are absolutely right that, like, well, and you would know this too, you know, having covered the internet and lived with the internet, um, you know, earlier, like, that is, like, the true, I think, spirit of the internet is, like, the way it can connect people and ideas, and yet still, uh, even though video games are very obviously technologically rooted thing, uh, it's not you know it's not like the distance to find out about these things. You don't have to type on a different keyboard. It's all the same keys. Like that stuff is out there. It is findable, um, but it is just sort of left on the table. And I'm not sure why, other than just the usual you know traditional boring. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's the, the business model as well. I mean, I remember when I was going to the Game Developers Conference, I was on the jury for Independent Game Developers mm-hmm. award, you know, award um, which, which, by the way, just regularly broke my computers <laughs> because of how, like, those games reprogrammed your hardware to optimize themselves. Mm-hmm. 
But those trade associations are they're sort of part and parcel of an industry. Right? They're 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 hitched up to the studios. So when I when I said that Kickstarter should hire hire a game critic, I mean, my my real point is that there's this there are ways for people who are passionate and creative to realize their project. Yeah, and that is a more fruitful place to look than you know the retail venues for truly new and interesting stuff. You can buy really, really great stuff that is, delivers against this genre in, in an in the excellent way. But I would love to see all the game developers on Kickstarter have a conference or do some kind of online event that people could... I mean, people used to do panels and post-mortems about um, what made their games good or not good or what they would have done differently... I think it would be amazing for people to do that for their Kickstarter buyers. And then also to cross genres. I mean, there's a renaissance right now in board games. Who who'd have thunk it, right? <laughs> so there's, you know, board games about birds and, and, and like crazy whodunit mysteries and, and uh, exploding kittens. And even this one that I just bought, which I absolutely love, called Poetry for Neanderthals, by the makers of Exploding Kittens, um, where the rules are, you so you get a card and you have to explain or convey to your teammate the phrase, the word or phrase on the card, using only one syllable word. <laughs> and if you use a more than one syllable word, someone gets to, to hit you over the head with an inflatable club called the nose stick. <laughs> So, I mean, that is an evening of fun right there. Right, right. And so, you know, I think that that, I, that joy, like I see more real joy and creativity in the board, in the, the, the board game renaissance, in the paper game renaissance right now um, than in the video game industry. But then there's also all, all, all kinds of really cool interactive media that's happening as well that's independent. And I think the whole idea of, like, this micro-patronage is just fantastic because, I mean, an Exploding Kittens, which is, like, a gajillion-dollar game now, I mean, yeah. that was a Kickstarter project. Yeah. Um, and toys as well. I mean, like, crazy toys like Turing Tumble, um, which is a physical programming at, uh, toy. It's 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 like the chinko, but you like you the way you set up the gates and the way the marble goes are all based on computing principles. Um, which if you have you know kids between like age six and whatever, right, <laughs> is amazing. Um, so so like I I think that the like so the business model always changes game design, right? So and this is one one of the the points that I might have made when, when we talked before is so, you know, an arcade is a quarter sucking machine, right? They're meant to be simple to master and addictive so that you, you know, you're about to get to the next level and the game ends and you put another quarter in it. It's, it's a business model dictates the design of an arcade game. And then you get to uh, your, your, your uh, cartridge games, your console cartridge games. And the business model there is you sell someone a cartridge and you want them to play through the whole game and never play it again. So you get this, so they buy another cartridge. So you have this huge epic of bouncing from platform to platform and big boss levels and all this crescendo so that you feel like you had a huge experience and you, you need to exhale and, you know, you're at the end of something. And then you go out and buy another cartridge and speedy rom game's the same. And then you, you, when you get into massively multiplayer online role-playing games, that's a subscription model. So what you really want someone to do is subscribe and continue to play and pay your monthly subscription fee forever. So you invest in all the characters, and then there's a secondary market in characters, and you want to keep people together because they're through cohesion, keeps them in the game, that keeps them subscribing. 
the whole design of an online massively multiplayer role-playing game is based on the subscription model. And then you in-game purchase, right? So you have a downloadable app on your mobile device and you want it to be free to get started and you want to get all these cool little things and then you have objects, right, that you can either grind to get them or you can pay to buy them. And that dictates the, the design of a mobile game with in-app purchase. And so, you know, I mean, this, this, this is like gravity, right? This is always going to happen. So the question is, how are the business models evolving? And then how will that affect the experience of the game? And this is why I'm intrigued by Kickstarter, an equivalent platform. Because if you have a, a population of people who are willing to pay in advance, for your game and a bunch of collateral around it. What, what, is, what does that do to the shape of the game? And then what does that do to the attention to quality in the game? Because if, 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 if something has to be a great poster, <laughs> you know, you may pay attention or a soundtrack, right? Even, right? Yeah. So maybe you have a great, artists come in and do the soundtrack to your game and then that, that becomes a separate thing. I mean, I, I love uh, I love soundtracks as music to listen to from movies. And, I, and a lot of other people must too because there's just a ton of soundtracks available now that you, could, that you can listen to that are really awesome. And, and, and then the interesting thing is that you have then a, a, a direct relationship between the creator and the consumer. Of, uh, of a work, right? So it's not going through a retailer. It's going through a payment clearinghouse, but that payment clearinghouse doesn't necessarily put an end cap on that can, can be easy to buy a product. And your relationship with that creator may last for years or decades. But if you're part of the community of people who um, play the, the Winston Wolf affair, mm-hmm. was, well, what are those people going to do next? And I think there's a lot of generative potential there because we put our attention and our funds to the support of creative work. And the creative people have an interest in speaking to, 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 to the, the participants. And so in that sense, they don't, even, they don't really need the critic. They need enough people to love it and tell their friends so that they buy into it. And I, I'm not unhappy with that as a critic. Yeah, I was going to say that's sort of, I mean, <clears throat> I don't know if all things are truly cyclical or a pendulum swinging, but that makes sense, right? As like, as the role, yeah, as the role of the critic sort of diminishes, or I guess another way to look at it, like as everyone has become a critic, like it makes sense that... Um, the creators would get more of a voice or would get more of a say in, or more power, I guess, in like maybe what they have. Yeah. I mean, I, the, I mean, the, yeah, I mean, I think that the thing is that the, like not everyone's a critic. Everyone is someone who like clicks on like, that's not being a critic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, so I, I think that there is a missing, a missing piece which is about the expression of insight and valuing quality and in creativity. Yeah. That, so I, that, and, and, but I think it, 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 is, it is the thing, and it, it, would, it would be helpful because, you know, people are, their attention is stretched. Yeah. They don't necessarily have a lot of time. I think for someone to do kind of a game theory column on Kickstarter, right, just to, to have somewhere you, where you could read about really cool and interesting things, whether you were a diehard gamer or not. And, and this is the important thing. It would usually be people who are not. 
to, to your point about writing to people who don't quite get it yet, there is nothing I love better than writing about something for people who are outside of that phenomenological context to the point where they would want to poke in and look at it or touch it because they, 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 they understand something essential about it. I never liked writing for people who are already experts on something because I don't feel like I can add a lot of value. You guys have all been there, done that. Seen the movie, got the yeah. picture. So for some, for people on Kickstarter who are busy buying, you know, like crazy ceramic chia pet planters, <laughs> <laughs> to come across some truly beautiful game that bridges into art that also maybe has some kind of educational dimension. I don't know. Like that, that, those are the people who, who ultimately a critic could best speak to because they're not shopping. I mean, I just for remember, a game. Yeah, I mean, I just remember when I started, uh, you know, professionally writing about games, which I guess is now somehow 15 years ago. I mean, my attitude was uh, in line with what you're describing and also this sort of belief of, you know, well, <clears throat> does the world really need another person to write another thing about another Call of Duty? Like, there's got to be some other direction yeah, we yeah. can go in. Um, but I don't know. I mean, like, I think we really did gloss over sort of, like, how the opportunity, you know, to do this column that you did, like, how that came about and sort of, like, how you started writing and um, how you sort of cracked into this philosophy I yourself. Think it was, I think it maybe was, we I talked mean, around it, the edges it, of yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, it was easy. I mean, it was a, sort of a timing, right? So I had a, a book about video games come out right as the New York Times was standing up a technology set section and wanted a video game column. Oh, I didn't realize so There that. wasn't yeah. really a lot of, you know, trying to angle for something, right? It was, it was, a, it was an emergent opportunity, and the timing was perfect. Well, and you positioned yourself, too, by virtue of the book, which... Um, yeah, and I had a really, really... And I had a really good agent, so... Yeah. That, you know, that, 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 that was, uh, that was just timing and the world turning in just the right direction yeah. and being ready and being ready to, to, to catch something. Right. Well, so let me flip to the other end then. I mean, so as you started to drift away from writing about games, like, were you happy, happier to write less about games? Were there things you were relieved? Are there aspects where you're just sort of glad you don't have to? I, I, I felt, I felt that I accomplished a lot Yeah. and I felt, satisfied with it and I, I ended up doing a lot of digital design and 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 some multiplayer interaction design and consulting uh, for companies that were trying to get people to use mobile devices in the early aughts or late you know very late 90s to interact with each other Right, so to, to be able to do things like leverage a camera phone, which was new yeah. at the time, right? So, so that was that, the ability to actually do stuff. I mean, I, I did a, a project with Pepsi. It, it was a year-long project to look at, well, how could Pepsi leverage interactive media? And in crazy ways, like we were even looking at whether it might be a, a possible to unlock um, some digital experience with a code on the bottom of a bottle cap. Oh, yeah. I remember and, that stuff. And, and, and the thing is that, that you have to realize, and this was a humbling experience for me, was real scale and the implications of real scale. So Pepsi has over a million points of presence and a Walmart counts as one. <laughs> and so when you when you think about right think think about suddenly doing something and having hundred you know hundred million people switch it on 
That wasn't technically possible. If you looked at what, what, what was necessary to ramp the Sony PlayStation, which was concurrent, and how hard they had to push technology to ramp from, you know, to half a million, you know, to a million, to two million, to six million over some number of months. <laughs> you can't go to a hundred million in a week. Mm-mm. And so, you know, when you really start to even appreciate the infrastructure required to support true scale, and there was no cloud computing right at that time. I mean, EverQuest, <laughs> when it launched, had a dedicated AT&T switching facility in San Diego just for EverQuest. And on any given day, one-third of the broadband traffic going into San Diego was just EverQuest, and that includes cable. Well, I was so, going to yeah, I mean, I was, I was <laughs> ask, like, how – I know it's hard to um, compartmentalize and think about these things in this way, but in, in retrospect, like, are there ways that your time writing about games, you know, influenced either – your approach to writing later, or maybe your approach oh, to sure. work in general. Later? Oh, sure. oh yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. And in fact, one of the mo- one of the most important papers I ever read about anything was the Bartle pla- the Bartle Richard Bartle pa- paper on player type mm. in in Mud. And I still I have this year multiple times sent that paper to people to make a point about politics in large bureaucracies and, and organizations of all types, because there are socializers, there are explorers, there are achievers, and there are griefers. And every <laughs> persistent environment contains all of them and must to some degree accommodate them. And that is a generalizable principle that someone who thought deeply about games derived, but is monumentally useful Mm -hmm. in across uh, any persistent environment to include organizations, regular, normal, real world. Enterprises. Yeah, I wish that stuff cross pollinated more. I don't know, like there were pipelines where people were aware of like how much of these types of um, headaches and ulcers and problems that we're facing with the internet that like uh, you know someone like Bartle has actually <laughs> written like a definitive paper on. You know, this is again the same. Yeah, thing and 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 about. I think it. Yeah, I, I actually may end up writing for like so Carnegie Mellon has a. Uh, they're ETC press, the ETC and I keep press, on threatening, yeah. threatening to write more from them with with time I don't have. But um, the the I, I think the application sort of writing about those principles in the context of things that aren't games. I mean, I think that what we find in social media is a triumph of the griefers. Yeah. Right. Like because all the griefers have realized that most of the people on social media are socializers. And those are the most fun people to kill if you happen to be a griefer. And so the, the way that we privilege griefers in social media means that everyone's experience eventually gets spoiled. And this is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> and, and so, and so the, what, what I, I think the real value of, of, of the knowledge, right, the, the, the accumulated wisdom is to then ask, well, how would we change that um, without moving into this kind of super griefer regime of, like, the institutional griefers who can say, well, you guys are out, you guys are in, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, like, the, the, the dynamic between the achievers and the socializers and the griefers um, and, and the explorers has been thrown off 
right? It's like the, it's like the microbiome, all the candida is taken over. Um, <laughs> so how do we, how do we then privilege the explorers? And I think that that's actually what's wrong with social media right now is that the explorers have been driven out. And I say this as an explorer, I'm like, my whole career is a testament to the exploratory instinct. Go find something you haven't seen before. Go someplace you haven't been before. Understand something that is different and people that are different. And then try to convey the essence of that to readers who also haven't been to those places or met those people or understand those phenomena. So I am an explorer at my heart. And I can't cotton to most social media because there is no space, there's no oxygen in most social media platforms for explorers, for people who will go across and then go back and say, hey, yeah, but that thing over there or those people over there, or let's try to understand it. There's no oxygen for that. So if we want to rehabilitate our social media, the game design question is, how do you create a space where explorers can once again exist as a species and thrive? And in fact, this is, this is, a, this is a question for our culture as a whole um, in, 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 terms of cultural exploration, real exploration and real curiosity. But but this comes down to games. Facebook as a game, Twitter as a game, because it is a game. It is a um, rule, it has rules, it has a goal, and it has a basic rule or a real outcome, and that is a mathematical definition of the game. Mm. Now, there are different games that are being played there, but it's definitely a game platform. But it is a, it, these are games that have no niche for explorers, where, where the exploratory niche has been eliminated. So, I mean, this is a, like a shorthand that people like you and I, you know, we can exchange and we understand because we've stared <laughs> maybe too <laughs> deeply in, into this particular abyss. But, I mean, this is right at like the the you know the tension spot behind the shoulders of like the writing i'm really interested to do which is to like sort of communicate to readers the fact that like you know games may not really be the patient zero of all these problems but like people who are into them were hanging out online earlier and you know they were aware of these problems and then they were marginalized and then blamed for these things and so i mean i don't know i guess like along another axis it doesn't have to be like this but um you know, we're talking about institutional knowledge and, and wisdom. I mean, are there things in hindsight that, you know, with your writing in the 90s, um, maybe you wished you had planted some seeds on that, that might push <laughs> a hypothetical now to be some other hypothetical now? Because I think, like, the interesting writing to do about games at places like New York Times isn't necessarily that, like, it's a Zoom alternative, but... Um, you know, it can be that, but I think that there are many other things too. I, I, I so I'm, I'm, I'm reticent to answer that because what appeals to me might not be a way to create something really popular. <laughs> but. So, so as they say, as they say in marketing, I'm not the demo, right? Sure. Um, but I think the interesting axis would be not to write about games so much as to use games as a lens. Because everything we've just talked about in this call. Yeah is predicated on an understanding of game design and how useful it is. And what the, the writing that I may again do, if, if I 
catch ever catch my breath yeah is really along these lines it it's it's that nothing nothing you know there's nothing new and everything old is new again and 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 the unplayability of those old games is just a testament to that but bringing this design discipline to the rest of everything would be a boon to people who aren't getting that much traction with their current tools. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that goes for game design. It goes for a lot of things. Like I think if someone really understood literature, they could probably bring, bring that as a lens to, you know, politics in a different way. But, but game design is, is my hammer. So everything's going to look like a nail. <laughs> But I, I, I've been thinking about that because there, that playing games is intrinsic to us as people. And we play according, you know, different games with different rules for different currencies. Uh, but everyone wants, wants to win the games they're playing. And they don't necessarily realize that they are playing them. And, and, and you, you see this even in, in um, some of the zeitgeist around social media where, you know, people will check out of social media for 30 days, you know, we'll do a cleanse. Yeah. Right? And, 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 and I think part of that is an inkling that I actually am playing this game every single day for likes, for, for follows. You know, I didn't exactly make the choice to play it, and I don't know if I want to. So what does it mean not to? Uh, it's become something analogous to the, I don't even own a TV <laughs> sort of rejoinder. But, I mean, I remember there was a time where it was it was considered um, more of a novelty, that sort of a thing, and now it's like a big statement of oh i'm not on twitter anymore you know oh i just you know i i mean like every so often i'll i'll sort of check into facebook i don't go on twitter i think it's just a million voices screaming in the wilderness most of which are bots but <laughs> every every I'll, I'll go i'll go on facebook and i will search for the one person who is a historian whose essays on facebook for a private group of friends i really met and then I'll look over some of the other stuff that reminds me why I'm not there anymore. Yeah. And it's like bumping into the X that reminds you why you broke up. <laughs> and and my my quip when I, I just quit using it was it's a bad Thanksgiving every day on Facebook. Um because that's what it is. It's that really awkward confrontational argument between people who know each other, maybe even a little too well, after too much wine at Thanksgiving, and they can't escape it because they're cousins. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's just like, I absolutely didn't value that at all. And, but at the same time, like I haven't escaped the the Zuckerberg Zuckerberg galaxy because I, I switched into Instagram, but I did it in a very different way that was very tightly curated to the things that bring me joy and um, and that the things that I posted, like I don't post pictures of myself at all. The things that I post are like things that I, I do, that I make, like stuff that's really beautiful. And when, so when people like it, I know it's because it has nothing to do with me. It's, it's because someone looked at that and thought, ah, oh, yeah, you know, like that's a pretty flower or, you know, whatever it is I'm doing. My daughter's flower day bread or whatever it is. Um, and I find on Instagram, there's this same sort of universe of, of, of people. So people who make things, it's so fascinating. If you look at uh, flowers, food, um, and craft, these are all the makers, right? And, and, 
And there's this, these network dynamics between people who live all over the world, partly because these things require no language, like a pretty flower or a beautiful bread or like a gorgeous piece of cross stitch or whatever you like to make doesn't require linguistic explanation. And even if it does, there's a translation service there. And I garden and I'll post a flower photo and I will get, you know, within three hours, I'll get 20 likes from 12 countries. And I, 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 that is the same magic that I loved about the original internet. And, it, you know, that it has nothing to do with games, Mm-mm. right? But it, there's this other space where, and it's very exploratory, right? Like, ooh, you know, who's that? What are they like, right? You can dive down that rubble hole, rabbit hole for hours and, and, and no one's fighting with you. Um, but so I, I think that there are these kinds of spaces. Um, I don't know that I would want to, you know, I wouldn't, I don't know that it necessarily lends itself to critical appraisal, but um, I, I do think that when you're talking about um, patterns of behavior and particularly patterns of behavior within groups or between groups, um, a lot of that is just straight game theory. And understanding game design as a practical application of game theory because academic game theory is pretty abstruse or can be is is, it's it's exquisitely useful and so that that's the that's the type of writing about that's that's where i think that game design knowledge expertise and wisdom really helps And, and and, and bringing bringing a, a deep critical knowledge to something that to, to a, like a, a broader context is that's what I look for in any great critic. I mean, frankly, one of my favorite writers. I mean, forever, um, in in the you know just the popular press, has been Dan Neal, who's the car critic at the Wall Street Journal. And he, he like he, he is a car critic. He will tell you exactly what, you know, the twin overhead cams are doing in a given, and he gets to drive these amazing cars. Uh, he, he gets to drive sports cars, but then he also drives like weird electric tripods and, you know, the big trucks and minivans and everything. Mm-hmm. And he always contextualizes it by saying, okay, well, yeah, this is a car. Here's what Subaru was thinking. <laughs> or might have been thinking, but then here's what it means in the context of like where we are right now in, in culture and in, in the, in the automotive industry and in our relationship with automotive transportation, like which is where we are right as a society. And he just nails it almost every time. And I, I just, I, I think that that's what the best critics do is now, like, am I going to take a part of car? Do I care, you know, exactly how, like how the engine's aspirated? I don't give a flip about yeah. any of that, but I, I love how he can go a mile deep into, you know, the sort of grill design and then, and then, then and then just kind of telescope out into, you know, like, what our primal needs are and how they're expressed in car purchasing behavior. <laughs> it's, uh, it's funny you say that because I'm flashing back on um, other conversations I've had, you know, through this over the last few years with other uh, critics who have written about games in the same time you were working. And they were telling me that, like, you know, they remember arguments that, like, games criticism belongs not in the technology section, but in the travel section, yeah, um, or that they should take an approach that um, it's ironic because I remember them saying like, "Oh, well, they should be, you know, these reviews should be less like car reviews." Um, but then you mentioned, you know, this one critic, and I think it's like, 
Well, we make all these arbitrary distinctions, but why can't that writing exist <laughs> in any section? You know, it's not like it's being dictated just because it's in the technology section. It has to be thought of a certain way. But I think like if games were written up in the travel section originally, yeah. um, it would probably look wildly different. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think you're, I think you're, I think you're right. <laughs> I think you're right. I mean, um, yeah, I, that's a, that's a great point because it, they are kind of a different place. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right on. Um, okay. Well, let me leave you with one last, uh, question, um, which is intentionally broad and, uh, just kind of, I'm interested in what your gut reaction thought is. Um, what do you feel video games have accomplished? Games have given people the experience of agency within a creative work. And that's important. It's important that you can not only view and hear a piece of creative work, but you can also do something within it. And that you're doing something is part of the work. Because, because it's done in a medium that will scale. Like performance art can't do that on a broad scale. Yeah. And, and the experience of agency is, is one of the big primal drivers of games appeal is that I am going to take action. I'm going to do something and I'm going to see a consequence. And previously that was something you did in sports, right? Or you could do it playing chess or bridge or, you know, physical game. The, the, the spectacular nature of a video game, the, the fact that it's a fantasy world, combined with that agency is the essential importance of video games as a domain of design.